Welcome. Happy to have you join us again. Welcome to this little mini lecture, which is going to be focusing on week 12. And we'll go to our PowerPoint now. The Native Nations of the Subarctic and Arctic this week. And we'll do a quick look at our study guide going up to module 12 or week 12 study guide. And um, we don't have any special new words to define up here, which makes it a little bit easier. And as usual, in uh, the blue font, yellow highlight, we have um, bits of information that are important to remember, especially when taking the quiz, as well as other features that are uh, good for you to learn about. In some of your groups, um, you've already had people, uh, in, in some groups, you've had people who have posted um, their mini project part one, which includes a paper or an essay about their particular native nation. And some people have chosen native nations or tribes that are in the Arctic or subarctic. So we'll also take a look there just to kind of refresh your memory to be sure you've read any of those that have been posted by your uh, fellow group members. As we scroll down, you'll see here we have Ishi, um, who is a very, very famous um, Native American because he was the last of his people. Uh, his whole tribe, except for him, had died, um, mostly being killed. So this is a good film for you to watch and learn about. And you'll notice that there's a highlighted quote here, my life has taught me to be more curious than afraid. And that's also in the PowerPoint. It's good, good to remember. There's some other words that are highlighted that uh, as you're watching the film, be sure that you can respond or answer or think about each of these bullet points. So we'll just quickly review them before you watch the film. Now we'll go back to our PowerPoint. So first thing to learn about that's on the PowerPoint is, you know, we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about a very cold part of the world. <laughs> and it's dark half the year. When I was in my graduate uh, program for the doctorate, there was a woman from Alaska who was flying back and forth from San Francisco every other weekend to be part of our uh, cohort of doctoral students. And during the winter months, she said it was pretty tough getting used to it always being dark. One of the reasons that she liked flying to San Francisco to be taking her uh, graduate coursework. So it's very dark, it's very cold, and it's very challenging. Uh, during the summer, for those of you who haven't been up to Alaska and places even further north, uh, in the summer, the sun doesn't go down, or it'll just be sort of like twilight for a couple of hours. And that's a bit strange. Uh, one time when we had an RV up there, we were rented RV, we were camping, and at two in the morning, some people pulled up next to us and they were shouting and playing and it was like having a great old time. <laughs> Finally, I went out and said, you know, I'm really sorry, but we're kind of used to California time. And to us, this is the middle of the night. I'm like, oh, sorry, dude, we kind of forgot, forgot how late it is. Wow, it's just so bright. OK, yeah, we can be a little quieter. <laughs> so it's a, you know, it is a place that has very few people. Um, maybe one for every hundred square miles. So that another way of looking at that is if you had all of Santa Rosa, 10 miles by 10 miles, one person, and then another person in another 10 miles. And of course, people don't live all by themselves. They'll be in small family groups even still. But most of the countryside is pretty empty. And we still only have about 100,000 uh, Native peoples in Alaska. Traditionally, the men would be doing the hunting and fishing, and still, but most of it by the men and women, the household jobs, which would include um, slaughtering animals, skinning animals, making the skins into clothes, taking care of the children, uh, teaching the kids things, um, the handiwork, lots of, of those kinds of tasks, which would be going on through the winter inside this is a picture of an igloo, but, you know, some sort of a home like that traditionally. Nowadays, more people live in town, but back even 50 years ago, uh, people would be living in those kind of shelters. And in the summer, a tent. So this is a tent that's made out of hide, because, of course, there wouldn't necessarily be the snow and ice to make into an igloo during the summer. And also because you may be traveling from place to place, 
uh, to be chasing where the food is. The people in this region uh, trade abalone, which is the shell from the abalone fish, which is kind of like a big snail in the ocean, uh, seaweed, clams, baskets. So people would trade back and forth for various items. And their trading network actually would go very far. Sometimes being transported by dog slate, like on this one, sometimes by water going up and down the creeks and rivers. Uh, I did go on a dog sled once at Fairbanks. It was pretty fun. Uh, they run along about as fast as a dog can run. And they sometimes are barking as they're taking you. And you're just sort of bouncing on the back up and down this uh, sled. And of course, it was a, a guided tour where, you know, the lady who had four or five of these dog sleds and um, would give rides to people who uh, were visitors. Eventually, the Russians, just like with Fort Ross, we talked about earlier, uh, Sonoma County, the fort along the uh, coastline that they sold to Sutter, uh, they also decided eventually that they weren't making enough to make it worth the trouble to have Alaska be part of Russia anymore, and so they sold it to the United States. You may get a question at some point and you see blue, it's like, oh, there might be a question. And it says uh, that the native people are hired as wage earners and they work for mining companies, oil and gas companies, lumber companies, commercial fisheries. You've probably heard of the Alaskan pipeline, which is very, very important. Uh, they work there too. And uh, you, that pipeline has been found to be very safe. And um, it's interesting because it's been elevated so that the animals can go under it uh, every so often. It's, and so that it hasn't really interfered significantly with the um, migrating animals. And it has provided a lot of work for the people who uh, live in Alaska, including the native peoples. So living in town, you have electricity, you have running water, you have sewer. You've got food, which can be very expensive sometimes, especially if you're in a place where they have to fly the food in. But there's food, there's going to be some medical care, there's schooling for the kids. Uh, so at first, people were sort of congregating near uh, trading posts. And then eventually, those trading posts, uh, which are accessible usually by water and now by air, uh, would become turn into small towns. And in Alaska, there's only a couple of larger towns but mostly pretty small villages where people will live and uh, it's less dangerous. And if you need something, you can get it. Whereas if you're way out in the bush, you can't. And it doesn't mean that nobody lives out in the countryside. It's just more people are living in town during the last uh, 50, 60 years. Yes, the native people in the Arctic, Antarctic, both US and Canada have had to take legal action to protect their rights their land and their resources. So the last point about this PowerPoint is, again, this quote from Ishii, good, good one to remember. And uh, he, I'll just tell you a little bit about him. You'll see the film, so you'll learn even more. But he was a man that lived with his tribe and people kept coming and, and either killing his tribal members or they took what they needed to live. And there's some surveyors in a film about him that you can pay attention. What are those surveyors doing? What did, how did that harm his, his tribe? And eventually he was the only one left way up in the mountains, Modoc County. And he finally came down uh, to a lower elevation where there was a ranch and basically kind of turned himself in. And then eventually the anthropologist, uh, Alfred, Prober, who's one of the most famous anthropologists in the country, went up to meet with him and talk, and which was difficult because nobody knew his language. And uh, Ishii uh, came to live in San Francisco. So it's a fascinating film. And he uh, was really a remarkable person. So I think you'll enjoy it. Now we're going to be learning um, about the, a folktale from the people who from the north, the Inuit, and their creation story. 
Rick Finn made the world and the waters with beats of his wings. He had the powers of both a man and bird, and could change from one to the other simply by pulling his beak over his head as one lifts up a mask. His earth was dark and silent. He had created water and mountains, and had filled the land with growing pea pod plants. After five days, one, one of the pea pods burst open. Out popped a fully grown man, the first to walk on Raven's new earth. At first, the man was dizzy and confused. He drank from a pool of water at his feet, which made him feel a little better. Raven had been soaring above his earth when he caught sight of the movement below. For a long time, Raven and the man stared at each other without saying a word. Finally, Raven spoke. Who are you, and where did you come from? I was born from that pea pod, replied the man, pointing to the plant. Raven was astonished. He had made the pea plant himself, without any idea that something like this would happen. However, he was pleased that his earth would now have inhabitants. Have you eaten? asked Raven. I've had a drink of water, replied the man. Wait here for me, said Raven, who lowered his beak and took the form of a bird. With a flurry of dark feathers, he flew off into the night sky. The man waited for Raven for four days. Raven returned, carrying two raspberries and two heathberries. These are for you. They shall grow all over the earth to feed you. Man devoured the berries in one gulp. Raven realized that berries alone wouldn't be enough to feed his hungry creation. Raven then began working clay to form two fat mountain sheep. When he waved his black wings over them, the sheep sprang into life and bounded into the hills. He made more and more sheep. Man looked at them so hungrily that Raven carefully placed them far up in the mountains so that man wouldn't eat all of them at once. Raven went on making fish, birds, and other animals and waved his wings over each one to bring it to life. Each one he put someplace out of man's reach so that he wouldn't kill them all, the fish in the rivers and the birds in the air. Already, Raven could see other men growing in pea pods, and they were soon going to emerge hungry too. Raven created a huge bear from the same clay to make sure man had something to fear. After a few days, Raven noticed that man was lonely. Raven went off to a quiet corner in the earth where man couldn't see what he was doing. He started building a figure out of clay. It looked like man, but was smaller and softer. Raven brushed his wings over the new figure, and the lovely being sat up and looked at man. This is woman, your helper and companion, said Raven. Man was very pleased. Together they filled the earth with their children, and before long Raven's earth filled with a sound of many voices and overflowed with many forms of life. Okay, <laughs> that was an interesting uh, story. So um, <laughs> hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, I like to hear our different stories from different cultures because it's one thing to have a, a list of facts about a culture, um, but when you see the art, including storytelling, which is an art, um, you have a better, I feel, understanding of what the people are like and also uh, some of the deeper meanings because of course all these figures that we see in these stories have very important um, meaning and depth to the people of that culture and as somebody who's getting it translated into English um, with us looking at it from our point of view if we're not from that culture we don't see as deeply into the story as the people do who are each figure including a raven or a coyote or a rabbit has uh, a special kind of meaning to those people because of all the stories they've heard and also because of of the characteristics that uh, that are both spiritual and material of those particular animals. All right, so that's all for this week. Thank you.